this week what we're doing uh we're doing major i'm trying to get the glare off of it major account sales strategy uh so the author is neil rackham i have with me my two good friends daniel Locke, zach Mofield. We're representing the Mason Dixon lines here with Zach being in Ohio and Daniel and I being in Alabama. Yep. But uh, a little bit about this book, uh, a little background. So I'm sure most of us out there have probably heard of Spend Selling. Same author. Um, so this book, it's older than Zach, right? It is. It is. When we, when we, uh, it's actually, started... it's actually older than me too. I looked at the <laughs> actual, po- it's only, it, it's uh, I think a month or two older than me, something like that. It was it's published in '89. Yep, that's correct. Oh, well, you're older than I am. No, am I probably more gray hair. All right, well, I'm 38, so it's not older than I am. But uh, <laughs> that's funny. I always thought you're older than me. Um, but I, what I like about this book, and we'll kind of talk through it, of course, is you know, uh. If you look, if you read Spin Selling, right, it's kind of your, it was kind of a watershed moment for professional salespeople where you go from just trying to pitch some kind of good or service to trying to identify the problem, understanding their pain, implementing a solution, right? That was really the, the heart of Spin Selling. And uh, for those of you guys that know, Neil had made his start in printer sales, you know, selling Xerox printers. Uh, I'll be completely honest. I can't imagine a more uh, undesirable sales job than that, unless maybe you know one of the ones that you've had in your past, Zach. But it's all a learning experience, man. You, you either win or you learn, right? As they say. So, <laughs> yep. I, I only say that because it seems like it's one of those zero sum games, right? Like either right. you get it or you don't, right? There's nothing more to it. Um, so it wouldn't be a good fit for me, but I know people have made lots of money and been successful in it. It's just it's not mine. Larry Levine's one of those guys. I I was just thinking that Daniel was reading it. Yeah, you're Larry, right. Larry Levine did, did fantastic in in. Well, I don't think it's copier, but office equipment. I think is the way. Right. I yeah, think, and actually, uh, I think, I think Daryl Amy did as well. Yep. Yeah, it is kind of interesting. You know, we we follow like I, I love Anthony Andrino and Jeb Blunt. And they all came from essentially commodity sales roles, yep. right? Uh, which I think is interesting when you consider that then it comes down to the the abilities of that salesperson really to differentiate themselves. So right. actually, it's probably a good school of learning to to kind of figure, like, rise to the top. Yeah, yeah that's, in, that's interesting you say that because, you know, I know we'll get in the book here, but they all, you know, Larry, Daryl, and uh, Neil came from that, like you're saying, the office equipment. Jeb came from, you know, the uniform and then um, Anthony you know, was uh, recruiting like recruitment, employment services. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then that was uh, Anthony came from there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's all. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. If you can be and, successful in commodity sales, I mean, you really must understand sales, what it takes to be successful in sales, because it's, you know, you have to have really understand your differentiators, how to actually take care of your your clients in the way that they need to be, uh, you know, taken care of. And so I think, yeah, there's a lot of valuable learning experiences that come Mm -hmm. from commodity sales. I had a a couple of years selling, you know, essentially commodity sales with, uh, Mm -hmm. with filter bags as well. And, you know, you learn a lot very quickly on, you know, being learning to be better, more competitive and, and move that needle even, you know, one two percent each time more in your favor versus what's the lowest price because that's the yeah. essentially a commodity comes down to what's the lowest price and it's like right. well you can out if you can sell beyond just whatever the lowest price is then you must be doing something correct yeah and that's a very good point um you know i've been in tech sales for a long time and i follow somebody that will he kind of highlights the kind of overview on what makes a successful startup and organizations and things. And one of the things that he comments on is sometimes startup companies, they will, when they're first hiring their first salespeople, they'll hire from big name logos saying, Hey, that person was super successful at some you know big tech company. They'll do great here. And that's not always the case, right? Because previously you're kind of relying on your logo. 
versus uh, your actual own ability. So that's a good point. No, well, I think I think we've touched on a thing that I mean, I know we kind of jump around and go, but I mean, chapter five, they talks about in there the differentiation and vulnerability. I personally, I thought that was my favorite chapter. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the whole book was was great. Like we were talking before offline, it was uh, very in depth and a lot. But one of the things I wrote down there was um, over and over again, I've been told by less success, successful salespeople, let their customer, or excuse me, let me try that again. Over and over, I've been told again by less successful salespeople that their customers are all the same. These salespeople generally do not go on to, they generally go on to say that price is the, the thing that um, most of their customers are looking at. Right. And so, you know, it just goes back to talk about what we had just talked about there. Uh, if you can't differentiate off price, good luck, right? You're, you'll win some because mm -hmm. there are some people I think that sure. uh, I've always heard the third, the third, and the third, right? Some people are going to say yes, no matter what. Someone's going to say no, no matter what. And it's that third in that middle that's like, hey, we've got to convince them mm -hmm. uh, this is this is the best option for them. And by, you know, a lot of strategies that we've talked about here, there, there's way to, ways to do that. What, what's your guys' thoughts? I, yeah. I've always heard, I've always heard, and I completely agree. If, if you're losing a sale on price, you didn't, as a salesperson, you didn't do your job correctly, yeah. right? Cause it's you, you get paid to justify that Delta between, you know, your, whatever the competitors are and their price point and yours, right? That's where we're, yeah. that's where we get paid. Um, otherwise if, if price isn't a can, you know, if price is the only thing that matters and nothing else does go buy it on a website, right. Or take the salesperson out of the interaction. And so if that's always the feed, like Zach, like kind of, uh, you know, that quote that you read, if that's always the feedback that a salesperson keeps bringing oh, I, we just don't have the lowest price. It's like, well, you're not uncovering the right, you know, issues or uh, the, you're not, Doing proper discovery, I guess, is the best, probably the, yeah. most, the simple way to put it. Is you're not doing a proper discovery, you're just letting right. them just dictate that process to, to the point where they're just like, "Hey, give me your price. I'll buy the cheapest," and that's the end of it. It's like, well, that's a that's a very challenging road as a seller. If that's the way, if that's how you're gonna gonna live, um, it is. It's funny, you know. I was reading this book, and I, I kind of go up back to it kind of bring us back to the starting of it. It's really interesting because uh, Ryan, like you said, with spin selling, it was kind of transformational in a lot of ways uh, mm -hmm. in, in the world of sales. A lot of it's because it's, it's a, I mean, it's a research book, right? It's a, it's a book that based purely off of research, not, it's not anecdotal. Like a lot of other sales books are like, Hey, I did so great. This is how I did it. Yeah. No, it's empirical evidence you know, over time, and it's like, oh, here's the research that they, I think what is it he used like something like 10,000 sales calls or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Um, it was the basis of spin selling. And what is really interesting is reading the two of these, right? Is, is this is the spin selling is like the the research section of the book. There's good nuggets in it, and it could really change your uh, your mindset on sales. But it's not it's not overly tactical, right? It's sure. it's like it's more on the theory side of things. Um, whereas, you know, major account sales strategy gets more, a lot more into the tactics and it's, yeah. and it's funny because kind of the, the next we'll say generation of books that follow this, you know, as what I kind of think, cause I was reading it recently um, is uh, suddenly blanked on it. Um, uh, uh, I'll have to edit this mine. <laughs> this mind gap out uh challenger sale is oh, what, I is was what actually to go to. Just about to ask you know challenger sale was great it was a lot of and yeah a lot of great research went into challenger sale yeah but it's not like what do you do with it it doesn't really give you a guide a guide to do with it whereas the you know challenger customer is okay here is your roadmap based on all of this you know uh this you know knowledge in um you know, evidence that uh, research based evidence that they provide. It's funny because they are both, it's very similar structure and how they are. Um, they're both delivered. Uh, I think they're both if, very relevant though to even today's selling environment. Didn't mean to cut you off, Daniel. So, no, no, absolutely. That was, that was one of the big kind of, uh, um, I guess, themes that I wrote down early is like, man, from a, a theory level, 
and you know i say on a broad level this book mm -hmm. is even though it's 33 years old it's still very relevant today now some of the tactics are dated like there's sure. specific tactics i mean this was written before the internet existed so there's some things that when it comes to like the buyer journey and and stuff like that yeah that that stuff has changed but and you kind of go back to the foundation of it it's still the same people still make decisions uh you know in a similar way it just it's a little, maybe a little bit more complicated or maybe you know some parts are have sped up thanks to you know knowledge in the internet but you know on a on a real foundation level this thing is still extremely relevant um, yeah today i would agree uh it's interesting you brought up challenger sale because i i thought about that a lot when i was reading this in full disclosure, Microsoft, where I work, we use Challenger Sale for our uh, methodology. Um, so I'm actually a big fan of it. But uh, I like this book, and I, I felt like, to your point, Daniel, it employed more of the tactical how-to. And you'd almost have to say, I don't think you have to read Spin Selling to read this book, but it definitely helps. Real quick on that, Ryan, I, I would agree because I have not read Spin Selling and he referenced back to it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think you have to, like you said. I think it definitely would help, though. But yeah, yeah, not to interrupt. No, no. Yeah, no, you're right, Zach. And I think, too, something that we should keep in mind. Yeah. So the book was written in 89. Spin Selling was like 87. Uh, those were pivotal, pivotal books when they came out. And they've really, if, if you look, a lot of modern sales authors will still reference those books. Like, hey, this oh, was yeah. the first time I ever heard something like this. And so, you know, when I was rereading or, yeah, rereading this book to uh, now, there were some themes that I've heard in other more recent sales methodologies. But in reality, they came from this or from spin selling. And so it was kind of nice to kind of get to the... The ancient text, so to speak. Go Zach. No, I was just going to say, um, you know, I, I agree with you. A lot of stuff that I've read, it, it refer, you know, they'll, they'll put the spin selling acronym in there or something like that. Um, and, and like I said, I haven't read it yet, but it, it's definitely on the list to read. Mm -hmm. But I would agree with you that a lot of things reference uh, this book or excuse me, spin selling, which I would assume they'd reference this as well. Uh, so it definitely seems like it was the first one, if you will, to hit the, I don't know if I'd say market, but it's like a big foundational rock, so to speak. And I think a lot of it to tie into Daniel's point about, hey, this is still relevant today. One of the notes I have down from from chapter one is um, we've seen. He, so Neil says we've seen many account strategy strategies collapse because they become so complex mm -hmm. that we forget that the basic fact is that these these decisions are made by people. Right. have a relationship mm -hmm. and, and have a conversation. I can't think of how many times at outbound um, the answer was have a conversation with someone. Yeah. Like when you ask a question or, or like their underlying theme. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's very, I want to say it's very basic, but it's be great at having conversations and be a great listener and ask great questions. It's yeah. just, you know, it's very, very, I'll, I'll say simple, but yet complex. No, you're right. Uh, there's, I had a great sales leader in my, in my past too. He said, whenever you get into a complex situation, just pick up the phone and talk to yeah. them. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. so funny you say that because I asked at Outbound, I mm -hmm. asked at the Outbound after dark, I said, it was specifically to Jeb, I said, hey, Jeb, we basically have one customer that hasn't bought as much as they had year to date. And he literally said, Zach, pick up the phone and call them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, yeah, and I think uh, lots of, oh, go ahead, please. Oh, I was like the what I really I think appreciated most about this book is that chapter one is how customers make decisions. It has nothing to do with sales, like right. like right that it's just like hey, I know this is a sales book, but let's not let's go back to what's most important. How do they make decisions? Because I, and that's kind of what like uh, Zach, what you said on you know sometimes we make the sales process so complex or, or yeah. hey we have all these great ideas this is how we have to to manage it and that's on our side but in reality you know we have to have alignment in our sales process w with what they're how they make decisions how they mm -hmm. buy um and and that's so great and i'm sure you know back in 1989 when this was published that was kind of a, a, a 
a different theme compared to other books back in the, in the eighties. And, and, and before that, it's, you know, it's all about, you know, seller, 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 and, and take a yeah. step back, you know, let's, let's, let's be in alignment with, with our customers. I thought that was just the best way to start um, a book like that. And, and then it gives it that longevity that we were, that we were just talking about. Yeah. Cause I do remember some snarky remarks from uh, our Gen Z or here, Zach. So <laughs> when, when this was selected. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, d- just to wrap up kind of what you, what you had said there, Daniel, you know, the, he in, it was great to read that first chapter about, Hey, you know, this is how they make this process. And the literally the last, last paragraph here in the, in the chapter, you know, effective selling strategy isn't about grand design. Uh, it says a few other things. It's, it's about thoroughly understanding your customer, knowing mm-hmm. the concerns your customers will have at different phases of the sale. So, I mean, it was just, it was great to just hear another theme, yeah. uh, have a conversation. And, and my note I wrote down is, you know, the, be the trusted advisor. That's one of the biggest uh, two word, I think theme, I guess that I've, I've had lately, especially after eating, uh, reading, excuse me, eat their lunch back in November. Oh yeah. It was just be, be I, a trusted I, advisor. And there's a lot that goes into that, but yes, I actually just got his new book. I feel like I'm pitching other books right now. But. Yeah, no, no, that's great. I was thinking about it looks like Daniel's reaching for his too. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I haven't I read it yet with the program. Yeah. I haven't, I read, haven't it read it yet, but I did have it pre-ordered. Um, and so it came in too. last week and, We'll see. We'll get to that. There's about, I don't know how many other books I've got. Yeah, I feel like I, um, I have an overabundance of books right now. <laughs> yep. <need> yep. <laughs> um, Absolutely. One question I think is always relevant is who is this book for? Like, in your guys' opinions, who's probably the right audience for this book? I'll let you go ahead, Daniel. I would say I'd almost say everyone needs to to read it to because it's the the foundation of it I think is so important yeah. across all sales because I don't think I think in today's again kind of back to up bringing this book into the 21st century I think a lot of like simple sales are gone right the mm-hmm. the internet has changed all of that uh, and eliminated a lot of that. I think almost every person in a sales role right who's we'll say is responsible for you know moving deals through the pipeline and closing them um, and those type of roles, they're all complex. There's nothing, there's no simple, simple sales left. So I think anybody in in a sales role needs to read that maybe a little bit less important for uh, people in like BDR type roles or SDR roles where, you know, you're just trying to get that open and then hand it off. That may not be as impactful for them. Um, Unless maybe they want to transition out of that role at some point. Right. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, it's it's not a, it may not be tactical for that. There's certainly sure. other books um, that that are a good use of time. Uh, but yeah, that was I was reading this like, man, this thing again. Some parts of it are dated, but it, it, it's so funny because you can tell as as much as we read too. You can you can tell how many other books over time have been basically taken part of this, yeah, and and expanded on it. Right. Um, in their own unique spin or way with, again, with their own anecdotal evidence, whatever you want to put in that. But it all kind of comes back to 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 this book. Yeah. Right. Or this with its counterpart spin. As you know, it's so funny. When I first purchased this book years ago, I thought it was more of a like an account manager type of book because of the name because i'm an idiot but um so but uh you know i found that this book is really good though for anybody that they have more than one sale into a company so you know taking the example of the xerox machines obviously if you're selling into a fortune 500 company that has multiple locations you want to keep advancing that sale and keep understanding their buying process and expanding and i i thought that this book did a good job of kind of highlighting those those tactics and nurturing those relationships and tr- coming to them with value versus just you know proposing something so i i found that it's for anybody as well that's a professional salesperson that's doing more than, you know single sale into a company i don't know zach did you have any other opinion on it 
Yeah, originally, you know, when you first asked it here today, I was thinking maybe a little bit more of a seasoned uh, salesperson. But after hearing you guys talk, um, you know, I think I've kind of shifted actually here in the last, what, 30 seconds. Oh, wow. All right. uh, just just because yeah, you guys were so, so convincing. No, <laughs> I, I think I forget who said it. Um, it was either Dan or you, Ryan. Uh, but somebody said, you know, all those, you know, most of the other books that we've read mm. have underlying themes in that, um, in which I can definitely see because I read those books first and then read this. So actually it may be beneficial to, to actually maybe start with this one yeah. and get a very basic understanding because I, I really think that fanatical prospecting uh, mentions spin selling. If I remember Oh, he, really. yeah. Jeb's a big fan. Yep. Of him. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, honestly, I, I think, you know, even if you're just starting out, um, I mean, shoot, anytime you can read and learn more, you know, one of Jeb's famous lines I love is, uh, you know, those who out learn out earn. So, it's true. I, I really think, uh, yeah, at first, like I said, I was going to say someone a little bit more seasoned, but maybe actually reading this one and then reading, you know, most of the stuff that we've uh, discussed and talked about, uh, you might actually be able to, to pull stuff together better. So so yeah. really anyone, I guess, to wrap it up. And I realized I had a slight bias. Uh, when you look at a book that's written in the 80s, you're like, yeah. I don't know, in your head, you're like, there's no way that's going to be beneficial to me at all. Yeah. But um, I, I was reminded that a lot of this stuff, I mean, a lot of the human psychology aspects of it and how you're approaching a problem that doesn't change. Uh, sure. Maybe, maybe the method on how you do it or, or Daniel, to your point, the buyer's journey is a little different now with, with uh, you know, so much knowledge being given to us through the internet and other things, but at the heart, you're still there to solve a problem and align with a buyer, right? So, uh, yeah, it kind of reminded me that some of the 80s models, they're still good. I, I fortunately didn't have that level of hubris, um, <laughs> mostly because... <laughs> wow! Uh, Should I not have because, been <laughs> No, no, it's okay. Uh, I was very, I was just very fortunate that spent... I, I have a my undergrad as a professional selling... Uh, program yeah. with it spin selling was the first book uh, of my first professional selling class and that so and you know that was back in what 2010 or something like that so i mean it was still i mean it was still 20 you know something years old at that point but um you know that was the very first book that was you know on our reading list was hey our professors like this is the book you need to you know we're going to base on the foundation of the class off of <laughs> Well, although I will say this is the first time I've read the follow-up book. Sure. I'm kind of disappointed that I was like, oh man, I, I let as, as great as spin is, I never finished the you know rest of his thoughts uh, up until now. But, you know, fortunately through all those other books, I kind of have gotten, uh, gotten a lot of that content, but, um, but That's no, funny. this is a, <laughs> I would, I would agree with you. I'll kind of go back to one of those points that you, you mentioned about, um, I know you're a, a, you know, in customer success and in chapter eight, I think he does probably one of the first times that's it had really been written about was like, kind of like, all right, continuing and growing within an account, right. like that taking that land and expand, um, you know, uh, model, and yeah. like, okay, how do we, how do you become very strategic about that? I think that this may be one of the first places I think um, that model or concept was really developed rather than, you know, Hey, cause again, a lot of times, and this is the salesperson A's account, you know, you get in the door, that's great. You still own it. All and right. then you start to become the relationship manager and maybe not, you know, strategically looking for that next step to, to grow it out. It's all done sort of ad hoc. That's yeah. the way it was for me previously, but it's like, okay, this is like, take the step back. All right. How do we really, you know, be strategic? Cause it is, it changes. The evolution completely changes once you're in the door and are, you know, providing the product or service, whatever that yes. is. It's like, all right, how do you grow beyond that? And that there's a wildly different set of, um, of needs and interaction at, versus the initial sale um yeah. and so i was you know it's like pretty neat to see that mentioned way back then and you know i don't think it, it took years for that concept to really start to grab hold 
pr probably till the iteration of, of tech is really who's. Yeah, I would really say it's probably the last 10, maybe 15 years, maybe. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to remember who, who was first, I want to say it was Salesforce, but I could be wrong. It was one of those you know, tech companies that really started rolling out. And he, he mentions that too, like in chapter eight, like the idea of farmers and hunters. I think sometimes there's like a, a derogatory attribute, a, a attribution to farmers, but it's, yeah. you know, if you look at a lot of businesses, you know, 80% of the revenue actually comes from existing businesses, right? It was existing customers. So you have to maintain and build those relationships and expand in them to remain successful. I, th I think it's a great point you guys bring up, you know, the customer success, if you will. You know, one of the, the lines in there he talked about, which I loved, was the business relationship is, is always doing something, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, it's never stagnant. It's either getting better. It's getting, what does he say? It's never, yeah, it's never static. Uh, it's either getting better. It's getting worse. I mean, it, it's doing something uh, either way. And it, it really made me reflect on, I'll, I'll say, past uh jobs I've been at with accounts and even where I'm at now, it's, Hey, you know, it was a moment to take a step back and say, okay, am I getting better with, with my accounts or am I getting worse or what, you know, what's the plan? Uh, yeah. not, not that we don't have a plan, but you know, what, what is, uh, you know, just a, a moment in time to say, okay, that's, it's a good refresher if you will. Yeah. And actually uh, in chapter eight, he uses, the author uses this uh, kind of dialogue back and forth where, a salesperson says, you know, they're, they just close a big deal. And so they're going to go on vacation and, and then they're going to get back to their other customers and spend more time with them. And he, he's kind of implying, Hey, you know, I, I closed the deal. <laughs> now I'm out. Yep. And obviously that's not what you should be doing here. Right. Uh, post sale is probably one of the most important aspects of your relationship with the, with the customer because you identify new problems. They're totally, uh, what is it what? I've heard before? They're totally engaged with you still. Go ahead, Dan. Oh, no. no, no. This is Daniel. I was, I was going to say, and he doesn't, he goes into it a little bit, but that's totally correct. There's that feedback of the, on the implementation side. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. from, from us going back to the sales, the sales process, it's like, oh, here, this is an opportunity for an organization to look and say, okay, here's a gap that we had on this, in the sales process that we need to identify because that may, you may risk losing a future sale based yep. off of something on the implementation side that you may not have been addressed or you may not have been aware of that, you know, another customer with their unique set of problems that becomes a higher on that priority list or, or, or decision criteria that he kind of mentions back, uh, yep. you know, back in the book is, Hey, now all of a sudden the, each customer's decision criteria is different now this implementation issue or whatever that may be mm -hmm. on that side, hey, maybe that takes more uh, more focus. If you're not there for the and, and doing that post um, post sale evaluation, you may miss that and you may miss the next three sales. Right. Yeah. Even with a different customer, regardless with the with the same customer. I think that's really really important. And I, I can't say that I've been in an organization where we really put a lot of emphasis on that. And, and I think it's, it's really important. It is. And I think it's an opportunity for us as salespeople to learn too. So like that implementation period can be full of stress, right? Cause you're rolling on a new product, trying to get all the processes in place. But if you're, I've been in a couple of organizations where salespeople will just dip out, right? They don't want to have anything to do with that. And quite frankly, I don't either. But, but what I've learned is if you stick around and you, still remain dialed in with the customer and maybe you've turned it over to like an implementation manager or somebody else, you still need to be aware of what's going on because you can learn from that process and then share those best practices to your next prospect or customer and talk about, all right, here's what happens post sale. And just, it's an added value and it really doesn't take a lot of effort, but to just kind of sit and pay attention. And that's, yeah, no, I, I agree with you guys. Like we, uh, you know, here where I currently work, we, we've got a, um, you know, when you sell something, then we turn it over to a project manager. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, I'm still involved uh, just to know, you know, what what's going on in case any issues do come up. You know, you can you're still involved in the process. I, I agree with you guys. I, f I feel like there's some companies out there where, you know, people get it, drag it in. And then it's like, OK, here you go. 
uh, you guys take care of this and I'll go find the next one. But yep. think about all that effort that went into getting that customer there. And if, you know, if they're going to be a repeat customer, stuff like that, you want to ensure that, uh, especially if you have a vested interest in, in it from a financial perspective, right? Yep. Like you want to make sure that this goes as smoothly as possible and they're completely satisfied there to, to use the enterprise term, you know, are they going to come back to you and rent a car again or what, whatever it may be that you're oh, selling? Is that, the, uh, is that the term? <laughs> yeah. Right. It would be completely <laughs> satisfied. Right. That, that's, that was the, the, the big term there enterprise, okay. but yeah, you know, continued business because not only is it great for your company you work for, but it, it could have a personal stake in that as well, depending on how your, your comp plan is written or stuff like that. Uh, but it, the big thing of that is, I think all that work and effort you put in to, to landing a sale, basically creating something from nothing, which I, I know we all have done. Yeah. And then to just, hey, here you go. Huh, don't mess this up. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I'm, I'm with you. And I, it's funny, uh, we've already kind of touched on the thing, but I feel like I should have started with spin selling years ago and, and then this and then the newer books. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of good stuff. <laughs> Yeah, you can you really it's you can start to like I said earlier identify those underlying themes, um, and I, I really and I think what we'll do is uh, share um, this the figure on was it six dash two on uh, page one fifteen when it's talking about consequences of issues um, and pricing in particular. I thought that you know I, I really love that chart because it's so yeah. it's so true. Right. Is, you know, price is important on that very initial conversation before understanding of value or what anything like that. Um, and then it, it drops as, as you have those uh, mm, you know, exactly. through the discovery there process. As you go through the discovery process and you're trying to, you know, figuring out what are their specific issues, price goes away during all that. It's like, OK, hey. how, how do we make this work? And then all of a sudden, it just comes roaring back there at the end. I think that's when the procurement person gets involved. Yep. <laughs> if I'm being yeah. sincere, I think that's when, when well, that happens. Yeah, typically it is. But I do like he, he does kind of dive into that a few pages later. And it's yeah. like, you know, he's he's using the, the term the consequences there. Um, but I really liked it's like, hey, there's a few a few points here that he uh, identified. It's like signs that which suggest consequences or you know you didn't do enough discovery or whatever mm -hmm. in, in one area it's like you know things that you thought were addressed unresolved issues previously you know coming back it's like obvious those all eventually if if you some of these items show up you're going to have a price conversation and you're going to get you know you back to to commodity um you know, uh, was it here? I'll, I'll just list them out here. Resurfacing of previously resolved issues, unrealistic price concern, unjustified postponements, unwillingness to meet, uh, withholding information. It's like all of a sudden you get, you're getting toward the end. It's like you, you're not getting that information back, you know, that feedback from them. Yeah. You know, they're going dark on you. Bad news, right? And we've all seen it now, you know, uh, every experienced salesperson sees it. You know, how do you, how do you address that? You know, he kind of goes into a little, into it a little bit. I don't think it was, uh, I, I don't know if it was just lack of research or just, you know, um, just didn't have enough, you know, words or, or pages in the book, but I definitely think that that's where a few people like, um, like Jeb Blunt kind of takes uh, objections and kind of t expands on, on all of those as well yeah. uh, on, on these topics. Cause I think it, it's just neat to go back and see that, Hey, these things have, they don't change in 30, 30 something, you know, 35 years, these things still exist. When you, if those come up, um, you're, it's going to be bad news for you. Um, yeah. it just, it, it's pretty timeless. No, I agree. I think it's in one of Anthony and Urena's books. I, I want to say it's the only sales guide you ever need, but it may have been his follow on book, but he mentions that when those types of objections come up later in the sales process, it means that as a salesperson, we skip steps. We didn't do enough discovery uh, or, and it's happened to me, especially earlier in my career. I mean, heck it's, it's happened later in my career too, unfortunately, but yeah. where I didn't identify that. Yeah. The person I'm talking to, they may be a decision maker, but there's somebody else that's holding the bag of money. Right. And I didn't identify that. I didn't ask that question. It didn't occur to me. And so, all of a sudden new parties are introduced later into the sales cycle that I sh quite frankly should have been aware of. Um, 
And so he, he does, like to your point, Daniel, he does highlight it here, but he doesn't go super in depth about it. But there are some other books out there that really do a good job of kind of highlighting that a little bit more. But again, it's kind of built off of this foundation here that we're, we're talking about today. No, I think I think you guys make a great point. And, and the one thing I would add to it is, um, you know, I'll, I'll say kind of the flip side of that, of when you prospect, uh, as Jeb says, every day, every day, every day, you, you if you get to that point in the sales cycle where you're starting to hope and wish that this one comes in because you've got a good pipeline behind you, you, you can cut bait and move on, so to speak. Right. Yeah. The Gina um, for Marco, if I'm saying that right, she wrote an article about that posted on, on sales gravy a couple mm-hmm. months back about she related actually fishing to prospect. You know, it was a really good article, but it was basically, hey, sometimes you just got to cut bait and move on. Right. Um, and, and learn. Right. The, just like we, we do while reading these books. We're here to just learn as much as we can and help people out uh, if they're listening or decide to pick up this book as well. Uh, but you, you learn in that. And, and the, to relate it back, kind of what you said, Daniel, um, you know, one of the things I had highlighted the, the very page after that chart on 115, when price starts to come back up again, is you're getting towards the end of the sale. And if you don't get the sale, he says in here that um, from the research that they have done in 64 percent of the cases, uh, it was revealed that price was not the most important factor. The real issues were consequences or risk or penalties associated basically with, with uh, switching. Mm-hmm. And I highlighted that because I can't think of how many times, especially early in my career, it was all about, well, you got to have the best price, which, yeah. you know, a- as we've all learned, that's that's not the case. You got to you got to be able to sell and differentiate and do. But to hear that over half the time, 64 percent, it's only 36 percent of the time the price is the big hang up. Like that yeah. was, that was very mind boggling to think of it uh, in that terms, um, just, just from a real data, if you will, um, back in, you know, like you said, 30 years ago, but it's still relevant even today. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, it's, that's a great point, Zach, because especially like in complex sales where the switching costs, so to speak, are pretty, pretty uh, high. Uh it's, it isn't always a price, right? That they're concerned about. It is, hey, it's what we're purchasing actually going to do what it says it's going to do. Is yeah. it going to make our lives better? Because at the end of the day, I heard it said one time in B2B sales, it's still a person trying to solve a problem, but instead of their own money, they're just using the company's money, right? But at the end of the day, you're solving some individual's problem. So, yeah. That's what you're trying to do. Wait, and, and the story, it was really interesting because throughout reading this book, I was in the process, you know, that it's starting to be springtime. And so the grass is starting to go, well, at least up here, the grass is start just starting to grow down there. You guys have probably been mowing all winter. Uh, yeah, but, I already have been to the beach several times. So. Yeah, see, yeah, the beach, yeah, that, that's not till a June thing for us. But I'm wearing shorts right now. <laughs> yeah, throughout the whole process of, of like reading this, I I was uh, contemplating on buying a new mower for our yard. And it was it was just so <laughs> ironic. Like while reading this, I'm like, Okay, I'm in the recognition of needs. Like our mower is starting to not, it's starting to act up. And then, okay, now what options do I have? And so I did a bunch of research on some options. And then I was like, well, what makes this one different from this? And it wasn't like anyone was really, quote, selling to me. Sure. Uh, but I was just kind of doing basically this process here. I was like, all right, well, here's how this one's different. Here's this and all that. Uh, and then my next thing was, well, the concern phase of, okay, well, yeah, that one's a little bit more money. But is it going to last longer? Well, this one's a little bit cheaper. You know, there's just all these factors. And then, you know, at the end, it was like, okay, well, what kind of terms do they have, so to speak? Are there any concessions they can make? Uh, Stuff like that. But it was just it was like this is a real life world example of maybe not being sold to, so to speak. Right. But being on the other side of being in the buying position and like literally going through these phases without really knowing it until I read this and was like. I literally have just done all this. And That's funny. Like, like you said, this was 30 years ago that this was written. So, I mean, you know, I, guess, I guess people want to know what you actually purchased. Sorry, I, I did end up, uh, I did end up getting an Aaron's uh, mower, but it was, I mean, it was a process though. I literally researched like 20 of them and uh, cause it was, a, it's a big investment. At least, yeah. you know, our goal is for this thing to last seven to 10 years. And uh, yeah. So Aaron's, Aaron's one. <laughs> I bought a, a Honda mower years ago for $50 from this guy that had a lawn business. And he was like, look, I'm pretty sure this will only last like a year, year and a half because the carburetor is out. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm uh, I'm at like 10 years. I've never changed the oil. 
Uh, I just put gas in. <laughs> I don't even know how it works, but for, it does. for fifty dollars, you said <laughs> yeah. that's the best fifty dollars investment you've ever. That's got. fantastic. <laughs> that's fantastic. You know, it it's funny. I I can't think of. I'm glad you you shared that, Zach. I, I can't think of who it was. It may be like a, a Grant Cardone thing I've heard years ago, but it was, you know, really good salespeople. We're promoting him now. Is that what we're doing? No, not necessarily. I don't, there's a lot of things. There's, yeah. there's little snippets of Cardone that are great, in my opinion. There's a lot yeah. that I'm not a fan of. But um, it does, I think it may be somebody else. But the principle is it's still an interesting concept that's been rattling in my head for a while. It's, you know, the very best salespeople understand, you know, they know how to buy. They really yeah. know how to buy it, and it, so everything good. in their life um, because to be really in tune with, you know, the like kind of like I said, go back to the first chapter here. You have to have that experience in buying things to really understand how to navigate it from the other side of the table. Um, you know, do you have to, you know, else, you know, out buy your ability to <laughs> to pay for things? No. Um, I think that's, I can't remember, like I said, it may have been somebody else, but that sounds like a Cardone type of thing to say is, you know, hey, you know how to spend your money. Um, uh, but sounds like I, you know, that, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that, that, like I said, that concept keeps, has always sort of been in the back of my head. That's like, listen, if you don't know how to buy anything, how are you supposed to both empathize with the person on the other yeah. side, but also, understand how to help them navigate that process because uh you know there's been several other books beyond this one but he does touch into it a little bit um you know helping them navigate their own internal journey right it, i think it was like chapter four or something like that where he's like you know evaluation of options like the, they may not know how to buy what you're selling right? if right. it's a if it's a new product that's never existed before how, who do you talk, who do you call, who do you talk to? You know, I, I think he uses an example in here on, I don't know, it was like um, voice to voice recognition or something like that. You know, you call it, you know, somebody goes and calls the security, you know, the head of security and they're like, oh, that's not our department. And you just kind of get bounced around. Nobody has ownership over something that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so knowing how, you know, they go through that process and help, you know, that's step one. The, the next one's like, okay, once you get in with somebody, you have to help them navigate that the, the buying journey, you know, in order to be successful as a seller. Uh, and I, I thought that was, like I said, just neat to see that that concept was there 30 years ago, you know, but so many, so many companies still use this features and benefits based selling, yeah. you know, sales training. It's, and, and I just, it's I'm like, it's incredibly outdated at this point. <laughs> It is, and I don't know if it's like, because it's funny, even, you know, we're all remote now. Well, Zach's not, but, uh, but you know, I used to be in a sales pit, so to speak, where all of us were together, sales guys. And you'd there's one person in particular that he loved to pitch features and functionality, and that was it. And, you know, we told him until we were blue in the face that that's not going to work, and he ended up getting let go. Really, good guy, but I, my next question was going to be how long was he there? So he wasn't, uh, you know, uh, he was a good guy, there wasn't anything wrong with him, but he just he couldn't like figure, like, I don't know, he couldn't like get the higher level thinking in, in place. But uh, I, I only say that to say that that mentality still very much exists. So I think we have to constantly reinforce ourselves and reinforce the professional sales community that we can't just default to features, price, and functionality because that it's the lowest common denominator and it doesn't advance the sale at all. Right. No, I think I've heard it said before, you know, if your mission statement is about, um, you know, Hey, we want to be the price leader or something like that. You're on a race to the the fastest one to get to the bottom to win. Uh, right. where Unless, margins you're like are razor thin. Right. <laughs> What's that? Unless you're like Walmart or maybe Amazon, like there's very few people who can actually like win at that game. You have yeah. to have massive scale. It, it, exactly right. Where where margins are razor thin, but you've got just a massive amount of uh, customers or something like that. Yeah, it's uh, doesn't boast well for uh, what what is that? It's got to be like ninety nine percent of organizations, right? So no. all that to say that again, you've got to understand the entire process from start to beginning, uh, and really, in my opinion, from both sides, which is what we we just touched on there, the whole buying journey and, and what it's like. So. Yep. Yeah. And Daniel, are you back? I know you're not on camera, but. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm having, I'm just having a uh, camera issues, but yeah, that's it's okay. Nobody good. watches, nobody watches the YouTube streams anyway, so <laughs> oh, that's good. It's though. all good. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. We, 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 I mean, we're 46 minutes in, but like, I guess to kind of wrap this up, it, I think we're all in, uh, all in agreement that this is probably one of those books that early in your sales career, or if you've been in it for a while, you should definitely read it. Like it should be one of the books that you have read or had access to. Like, was there any disagreement there? Yeah, I'll go. So I, no, I, I would agree with you, Ryan. I, I would definitely, um, definitely put this one in the library. Yeah. Uh, my, my personal opinion. Um, I still think maybe, you, you know, if it were me, I would still read fanatical prospecting first. That's just, Really? My, that's my personal opinion. Yeah. I just, for whatever reason, I, I think I just connect. And, but that that's my opinion. And you I just want one more call. That's what, what you want to do. Yeah, exactly. The 11 words that changed my life forever. Right. When it's time to go home <laughs> at the end of the day, make one more call. So, I mean, I, I just thoroughly enjoyed that book. Um, and, and I think it was just at the time when I, I needed to read that I did. Uh, but I, I would still put this one up there. Uh, just like we said, just to know that, Hey, there's a lot of themes and a lot of other things that you read will, will come up there with that. But uh, yes. yeah, so basically, yes, I would recommend it. I would definitely say get it and invest the uh, the time in, in reading it. So, Daniel, how about you? No, I think that what's interesting on this one, and as I, in a lot of ways, I agree with you, Zach. It's There's a lot of really great books for a lot of folks out there. But I kind of go back to, like, you know, if you're going to read all of these other great books that are out there, you know, they all kind of have a, you follow the roots back and, and they kind of mm -hmm. go, a lot of them just keep coming back to, to the, these principles and, and theories that, that Neil you know, writes about. And it's like, you know, I almost as a, almost as a, a, a paying homage to, to what all of these other great books are, you know, have where they come from. You almost have, I'd say I almost have to read this, you know, again, there's certain aspects of it. It's obviously it's dated in, in some ways, but um, no, I think, I, I think I wouldn't put it up there first, but I think yeah. if you're going to really start diving deep into, you know, some of these other books that we've read, you know, I, I think you really need to understand where those other books are coming from to, to get the all of the, uh, the, the value out of them um, that, that they you know offer um i mean not to say that they without reading this they you still are very impactful books but i think you know it's that kind of that next level it's like all right i can get 85 percent of the value out of uh, some of these newer age books but man squeeze that last dr few drops out of them you understand where this one uh kind of leaves off yeah uh, i would agree uh, i i think there seems to be common themes in a lot of the books that we talk about and this book, Spin Selling, and a couple other authors are really kind of the impetus for a lot of the modern sales books that we read. And so I found that this book was very beneficial to read again for me when, after I'd read a bunch of other books because it kind of tied things together, again, themes that I've been reading. So I definitely recommend it. Um, doesn't have to be first, but definitely would if you're, if you're interested in sales and advancing yourself. I think it's a great book to read and, and kind of dig, dig into. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. So just, uh, I don't know if, if you know, Ryan, obviously you're, you're hosting this time, but just so everyone knows, uh, think again will be our, our next book. by Oh Adam yeah. Grant. So okay. I personally haven't read it. Uh, have you guys? No, in fact, I, uh, this was, this was Daniel's recommendation here. It was, it, it was the best book that I read probably in 2021. Um, I really, I still think that now that was, I haven't read it again since the first time I read it, which like I said, it was about a year ago, but I just remember when I put it down, I was like, man, this is just, it's not necessarily a sales book, but it definitely makes you, you know, it makes you think about some of the decisions that you make, mm -hmm. you know, how you go forward um, and just kind of how people think too, because that's, it's so in, important for what we do is, understand people's motivations and, and how to influence them. Um, it's, it's definitely, it kind of goes back to organizational behavior, right? That's what Adam Grant really writes about is a lot is kind of organizational behavior. And so I thought it was, as I'm reading, I'm like, this is very, uh, 
a, a lot of this resonates from a sales role um, without actually, you know, talking about sales process and, and everything like that. So now I'm really excited to pick it back up again. My, it's even been recommended in my wife's uh, book club. At, uh, really? You know, yep. Is your wife uh, in sales? No, my wife's a teacher, but, <clears throat> Interesting. you know, it's essentially, it's still sales. Uh, yep. It's just, uh, that's the beauty of, of teaching is it's still trying to get kids to be passionate and, and learn and selling, selling them on the idea of knowledge. So, um, so yeah, it's, I'm really, really thrilled about it. Our, I'm already excited. We have to schedule it so I can go yeah, back and start reading it again. Right. I need to buy it. <laughs> so. All right. Well, I, I, I think this is another successful I'm trying to get the glare off. So major account sales strategy by Neil Rackham. Again, it's, it's one of those oldies, but goodies. I think it's, it's a great foundational book and a lot of the themes and, and mindset in it are very relevant for today. So go out and buy it or steal it from somebody. <laughs> I bet it's in a, I bet it's all over like libraries. It's old enough. It's probably in a bunch of, it's yeah, it, it, I think I know spin. I've seen spin in, in our public library. Well, I'm sure it is. So I'm sure you don't even I, have to buy it. It's always I, a pleasure, fellas. Yeah, you guys too. Thanks for the blue shirt day. That's right. <laughs>